Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I am a white settler, cisgendered, disabled female, and I want to make it very clear that for anybody who in our community who is racialized, indigenous, uh, gender diverse, or identifies in any way that is not, you know, typical, everything I'm about to talk about around disability is greatly magnified and intensified for those people because they are living with multiple layers of marginalization and bias. Um, let me explain the cast and why I'm relying on Sighted Guide today rather than my guide dog. Um, on Easter Saturday, I was crossing the street on a crosswalk. Um, we were about, we being me and my dog, who was new to me by the way, and also traumatized, um, were maybe midway across the, the crosswalk. Um, I guess we weren't moving fast enough for drivers because a whole line of traffic, of course, began, began encroaching and, and uh, you know, zooming behind us on this crosswalk. My dog is trained. All guide dogs are trained to come to a complete stop if traffic is moving around or toward us. She stopped. And even a small lab, when they stop and dig in, it's like trying to move dark matter. If you have a dog, you know what I mean, right? So I was highly anxious because I knew Easter Saturday, turkeys are on sale at Dominion, my life means nothing right now. So, and of course, as they're zooming by, and multiple, I mean, tens of cars, um, now people are blaring their horns at me, which is elevating my anxiety. So I am now holding the dog's handle in one hand and with the leash, urging her forward. Because I was distracted in this way of the trying to get my dog and myself to safety, I didn't do what I usually do on crosswalks in St. John's because the curbs are not accessible. You may remember a couple of years ago, Elizabeth and many other activists, mobility activists in St. John's, we gathered on Water Street, we took yellow industrial chalk, and we chalked the edges of every step in every alleyway, including George Street, all through the downtown, um, to demonstrate what, what a small, inexpensive accommodation, how it can enhance safety, not only for visually impaired people, but for all people, right? That has never been followed up on by the city. So the curb was indetectable to me. I don't have depth perception. So what happened was I went ass over tea kettle onto that curb, broke my arm, messed up my back. Six weeks now I cannot work my dog. This means going back to retrain with her in, in Ottawa because if an animal experiences trauma or distress in a particular location or situation, it is probable that the animal will be averse to returning to that location or situation. It's costing me money for transportation. I have, and I'm very fortunate and privileged to have this, an army of friends and mutual support <laughs> kind of comrades who are helping with my dog, bringing groceries, all this kind of stuff. But it's, it is, and, and this is relatively minor compared to the multiple pedestrians who have died in St. John's um, in, in risky pedestrian conditions, right? So that explains the cast. And the, and the dependence right now. So that said, um, a friend of mine said to me last night, and I thought this was a really apt phrase, so I'm gonna open with this. In many ways, when it comes to mobility justice and ease, um, people who have disabilities are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine, right? If we are safe, if we are safe, chances are high that you're going to be a lot safer as well. 
And usually when I talk about accessibility, as we all do, I, I kind of um, sort of land on what the accommodations are. Like they need to do this, we need more rents, we need more you know, accessible doorways, we need more audible crosswalks. By the way, by the way, speaking of mobility justice, we have 116 automated crosswalks in St. John's that are designed for people who can see, okay? Of those 116, 16 of them are accessible to me and people who cannot see. 16 audible crosswalks in the city. And you know what the big plan is? To add two a year. So in 50 years, I and people who experience uh, sight loss or even certain types of neurodiversity and children for whom audible, uh, audible crosswalks are super beneficial because they kind of snap the driver into an attentive mode, right? 50 years is the plan. So today I'm not going to talk so much about solutions with regard to actual uh, bricks and mortar kind of accommodations. I'm going to talk about the thing behind the thing. I'm going to talk about attitude, I'm going to talk about ableism, and I'm talking about outright at this point, at this point, up until, I'm going to be generous, up until say 10, 12 years ago, we could kind of, sort of, kind of go with the narrative, this is unintentional bias. We can't say that anymore. I'm sorry. We can't say that people don't understand. And if they do understand, they do not belong in positions of leadership. Period. We have a very, we have a very diverse and increasingly diverse community, which is what we want. So it is no longer acceptable to say, we didn't know. You know. And if you don't know, move over and make space for a representative from one of those communities. Because diversity and representation of diverse generations, um, cultural backgrounds, um, racial backgrounds, religious backgrounds, indigeneity, gender diversity matters. And it will make all the difference here. It really will. I'm going to throw some facts at you about well-documented forms of ableist discrimination. And I'm going to follow them, each one of them, with an example of what's happening right now, out of sight, Shh. in St. John's. A study was done in the United Kingdom in the middle 2020 teens. It was an exploration into um, something called disability fraud. Notice the title. Notice what, how this is identified, okay? So disability fraud is um, is an infraction of, of laws or uh, criteria to receive services, for example. And the idea is that you have people who are non-disabled posing as being disabled in order to get whatever benefit they perceive we have that they don't, right? So um, the result of the study was that in fact, Although frequently there are, there are processes in place to protect um, the service givers from being fraudulently exploited, the fact of the matter is the data in that survey showed that in fact it only occurs 4% of the time only 4% of accusations of disability fraud were actually valid. If you Google, I invite you to do it because it's a real eye-opener, Google disability fraud. And you know what you're gonna come across? Page upon page upon page upon page of how to turn your neighbor in, 
how to become a private investigator. You think you think somebody somebody in your workplace is is enacting this this crime of disability fraud? It's all about it's all gotcha gotcha gotcha. Okay. Another fact. It is far more likely, far more likely, that a person who has a disability is passing as abled, not the other way around. I was one of them, right? There are many people, I'm sorry to get emotional, but this is my passion and my purpose. I will not stop talking about this until it's fixed. Um, a Powell, A is on the panel with me, has herself, themselves, written about this. Lisa Walters, who you may know as Damsel in Address, YYT, has written about this. We, many of us, have lived that experience of passing as able, because if you identify your employment opportunities dry up, your living situation may evaporate, you experience discrimination. In St. John's right now, there is a whole revision of who is and who is not legitimately using GoBus. People who have lifelong immutable disabilities are being put through an interrogation process which they have already qualified for this service. They have already qualified. Yet because the service is overburdened, suddenly everybody is required to appear before a committee of health professionals and defend their disability. This is, I don't understand how this got, got by the Inclusion Advisory Committee. I don't know how disability organizations have not spoken up against this. So I was given permission to relay this story, and I will. I will not mention the woman's name because it's her story. If there is a journalist present who wants to follow up with her, she's given me permission to give you her contact information. So a friend of mine who is a woman, she has cerebral palsy, which is um, a physical condition that um, exists from birth. It's often the result, actually, of a birth injury. Um, and she has and will continue to use a wheelchair in all probability for the rest of her life. She was summoned to appear before this committee. Um, a kinesiologist was asking her questions. You know, what is the nature of your disability? I have cerebral palsy. The kinesiologist then um, continued to probe with other questions. Her response was, I don't have to answer those questions. I told you everything you want to know. There was resistance to her response. Her medical trauma brackets. What many non-disabled people may not know is how many people who have disabilities are living with medical trauma. There are many people who from early childhood have been, um, have been victims, I'm using that word kind of cautiously, but have, have experienced multiple very intrusive medical procedures and surgeries. There are many people who later in life may develop or acquire a disabling condition and they, if they sometimes are hard to diagnose, particularly if you identify as female. There'll be a lot of gaslighting. What you experience is gaslighting, right? Medical professionals who don't believe believe your pain. Um, uh, it may be a rare condition. It may take a long time to diagnose. So your family might think you're malingering. Others may think you're malingering. You know, you're, and all the while you're in pain or you are like, it's a legit thing. But the result is that this, this phenomenon of medical trauma is quite common among people with disabilities. End of bracket. Okay, so she has cerebral palsy. She, she responds to the kinesiologist. They're, they're kind of probing, oh, you have to do this, it's part of the process, blah, 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 blah. She's getting more and more agitated. She finally melts down. She's crying. She's trying to leave the room and wait for it. 
If you don't settle down, we're calling the police. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a little much to digest, isn't it? This is St. John's, the city of legends. Come one, come all. You don't have to be born here, but you bloody well better come in with a very typical body and brain or your life is going to be really hard. Sorry, I know it's sad. So what are some solutions? Universal design would be a good one. And the careful avoidance of universal design, both by our province and our city, should be a red flag. It is a red flag. We all were very saddened and shocked by the sudden death earlier this year of um, universal design like champion architect Grant Genova you know and and his life was celebrated at City Hall but the best memorial to Grant is to keep going with this work and get it done right another solution which I think is an absolute necessity is that um, in every municipality in Newfoundland and Labrador, but especially in this one because by our sort of capital city status, we kind of are expected to lead the way. I think that it must be, whoa, that we the public must insist that for every council taking office, beginning with the next council, that it is absolutely mandatory that each and every one of them with their senior staff must take anti-racist, anti-colonial, anti-ableist training. It has to happen. And it is, an, uh, I believe that in light of everything I've just told you, that 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 training should be delivered by entities or organizations, first of all, by the people themselves, by racialized indigenous or disabled people. But I think that it is very unwise to continue to trust, um, how should we put this? I don't think it should be in the hands of organizations who are receiving funding from the city. Um, I don't know what's happening because I'm not on the inside. I don't, I don't know how something like this go bus process, which is... Anybody who has any kind of basic literacy in, in disability theory would have shut that down in, in like a New York second. Um, so I, I cannot explain how that is, things like this are happening, um, but it is possible that the fact that some organizations, if not all, are receiving funding from the city might be a kind of have silencing effect on them. I don't know. Um, so that would be another solution. Um, Thirdly, I think that <clears throat> when elections come around, um, I think that we all have to be very cognizant of the fact that people who exist or come forward from any of the minorities that I've named uh, are going to have significant barriers. And I think the best that we can do for them is what we have to do. I think we really have to rally around diversity because I truly believe that doing the same thing only, you know, with more energy is not, it's not going to fix anything. It's not going to fix anything. 
And I also believe that, you know, we get caught on this narrative of money. There's not enough money. There's not enough money. There's not enough money. There's enough money for the things that you consider to be of value. And there's a big difference between cost and value. And I think, I think if we have the ability to kind of chain, like flip that script, to use an overused term, um, because it is a deflection. People are being hurt. People are living with a burden of poverty that's being imposed upon them that this is certainly a factor in. Um, even with the go bus thing, you know, like as a, as a visually impaired person, if they sort of, I don't use go bus, I never have. I do have the card. They haven't called me. I may have been, I don't know, but it's possible because I've never used it. They've just kind of written me off, doesn't matter. Um, to me, it represents a loss of independence, honestly, so I, I avoid it. Um, but, you know, what other panelists have been saying is so true. It's like, I rarely use Metro bus because it's not accessible to me. There's no, no, I never know when the, where the bus is stopping. I'm like, well, where am I? Um, but also, uh, there's, it, there's not enough room to accommodate my guide dog, really. Like, the only place she can fit is in the aisle, so she's a tripping hazard, and I'm on complete lookout all the time, and I feel like I'm having to police all the other riders, uh, which is very uncomfortable. But also, as I'm getting people mixed up now, but as, as one or two panelists pointed out earlier, you can get on a, on a metro bus on point A, which is reasonably accessible to any pedestrian, but you don't know what awaits you at your destination. You might be deposited in a snowbank, right? And then have to cross four lanes of traffic. Um, I think I'm getting close to my 10 minutes now, so, I will leave it at that and thank you for your attention. And I do believe that like, if we keep pushing as a community and, and like just stand in solidarity with each other, over time we will get this done. Thank you.